So I have two projects going on at the moment. One is switching my daily driver to the Intel Skull Canyon NUC with the Razer Core uh, as a combo. You can see the video here. And the second is converting my previous video editing workstation into a media server, NAS and video rendering server. In part one, I put the hardware together in a new rack mount chassis, along with some new hard drives and an LSI hardware RAID card. So with the hardware built and Windows installed um, on a RAID 10 SSD setup via the motherboard RAID, and I should point out it's uh, only Windows because I need to run Adobe Media Encoder on there, um, I now need to configure the storage drives on the LSI hardware RAID controller. I'm not using ZFS for this build, maybe one day I'll do a video on why that's not the right choice for my needs, um, but for home users such as myself, I believe it's too expensive and the issues it solves are simply replaced by other issues that are far more likely to occur in this kind of environment. So a RAID card it is. There are several RAID configurations that you can use, but the most common for the home users are RAID 0, RAID 1, RAID 5, and if you have the real hardware RAID card, the lesser known RAID 6. So First off, what is RAID? Well, Wikipedia will tell you that the acronym stands for a redundant array of inexpensive drives, which is just a fancy way of saying that it lets you combine a collection of, of drives and make them look like one to the OS. So a real hard drive is called a physical drive, but what the OS sees if I combine two together, say, using RAID, is a single logical drive. So what you see in your hand, physical drive. What the OS sees, logical drive. Now, there are several ways of combining a bunch of drives to look like one, and these are known as RAID levels or RAID configurations, uh, and each one has different pros and cons in terms of performance, storage capacity, and protection. So I'm going to compare the most common types that a home user will encounter. I'll explain how they work, how to calculate the capacity that you're going to get, what performance you should expect, and how they'll behave when the worst happens, one or more physical drives fails. And on this note, I want to give you a very important warning. And if you take away nothing from this video except this, I'll be happy. RAID is not a backup. RAID systems can and do fail. All the data you hold on a RAID array can be lost. And because it gives you only one version of your data, if that file gets corrupted, you delete it by mistake or you suffer a flood, fire or theft, your data is gone. Never, ever, ever trust your data to one place. No matter which RAID config you choose or if you want to go with a fancy ZFS system, you must have backups. And this means having multiple copies of your data stored in more than one place. Ideally, at least three copies, one of which is off-site. In other words, not at home. Now, I'll cover how I do my backups in another video, but for now, let's take a look at the different RAID systems. So just a quick note on the equipment that I'm using here. The hard drives are HGST uh, NAS models, six terabytes each, spinning at 7200 RPM with 128 megs of cache on board. Uh, for a 7200 RPM NAS rated drive, these were the cheapest ones I could find, uh, at least in the capacity that I want. When you're choosing hard drives for a NAS server or any server, it's important to go with ones that are specifically designed for NAS use as opposed to desktop use. Now, some of you might be thinking, well, what does that mean? Isn't it just the same drive in the box with a different label and a higher price tag? No. In addition to different firmware, there are often physical differences inside, mainly around vibration protection, um, as a typical desktop computer has only one or two spinning drives at most, whereas a server or a NAS will have a whole bunch of them, often packed closely together. Now, this can lead to huge amounts of vibration uh, and heat, neither of which drives respond well to. So, some drives, such as the Western Digital Red Pro editions, have their spindles attached to the top of the case as well as the bottom to give them better stability, causing less vibration and actually being able to accept more vibration. Um, they're not the same as desktop drives. Now, I'm using a real hardware RAID card on this system, and I'll explain why later, which is around $300 for the card and around $200 for the cache battery that you're going to need as well. So if you do go down the hardware RAID route, you need to budget at least $500 for it. The exact card I'm using, if you're interested, uh, is an LSI 9271AI, which supports up to eight SAS or SATA drives at their full six gigabit per second via two onboard mini SAS connectors, which are each connected to one of the two four-drive backplanes in the Norco chassis. 
Okay, so let's run through what each RAID level is, predict the performance that we'll see, and then benchmark it to see if it matches our expectations. So for the purposes of our explanation, let's pretend that this is the data we'll be saving. Remember, everything in a computer is a one or a zero. So this little pattern here is our raw data at its lowest level. For readability, I'm going to divide it into four pieces like this. Note that a single hard drive, the, the HGST uh, NAS versions that I've bought, deliver 230 megabytes per second of read and write speeds when you're writing, when you're writing large, as in multi-megabyte, sequential data. And large sequential data is what I care about, as I'm mainly storing large raw photos, multi-gigabyte video footage, and multi-gigabyte movies, and so on. So let's start off with RAID 1, which is mirroring. RAID 1 requires two drives, and the second one mirrors the contents of the first. That way, if one of the drives fails, you have a complete identical copy of the data on the other drive. Pop in a fresh drive, and that data can be copied over to the new drive, putting your, your protection, your redundancy, back into place. Now, as the second drive is just a copy of the first, this means we'll only have one drive's worth of storage space available to us. Now, I'm using six terabyte drives, so if I run RAID 1, I'll have a total of six terabytes available to me, even though I'm actually used 12 terabytes worth of hard drives. So this setup protects us from the failure of a single drive and it wastes half the capacity that we paid for. But what kind of performance does it deliver? Well, let's see if we can work it out. When we write our data to the drives, uh, in this case, we're writing the first four bits of info. Although each drive is writing at 230 megs a second, they're writing the same piece of data. So as far as our OS is concerned, we're writing our file at 230 megs a second, even though two drives are busy. So let's predict the write speed of the array to be 230 megs a second. What about reads? Now, this is where some people get misled. They assume that we can read the file uh, or half the file off of one drive and the other half off the other. Now, sadly, with the exception of some sort of Unix systems and Linux, that's not the case. So our read speed will actually be equivalent to that of one drive in our case, 230 megs a second. Now, some people are probably disagreeing with me already, but I'm going to predict read and write speed of 230 megs a second. So what do we get? Let's take a look. Crystal Disk Mark reports a sequential read speed of 224 megs a second and a write speed of 267 megs a second. The figure for the writes is slightly higher uh, than a single disk because the RAID card has one gigabyte of cache on it. So you can expect writes to be slightly higher than our calculations, but only slightly. Now, the higher figure above is when we simulate a large queue of disk commands, like when you get multiple applications or users reading and writing to the array at the same time as each other. In this case, the RAID card can use both drives to get the job done. And our previous calculation goes out of the window, as our example is a single file being read or written um, by one app or user. The concurrent access numbers will always be higher. But for most home users, you're probably just writing or reading, you know, one large file at a time, give or take. Um, the chance of somebody else accessing the array and hammering it at the same time that you're hammering it is, is pretty slim. So this single user sequential access is the one that, you know, I care about. So we'll add that to our results list. If one drive worth of space is enough for you and you just want to protect it, then RAID 1 is probably the best option. Um, you don't need an expensive hardware RAID card to do this. The Intel RAID built into the motherboard is plenty fast enough. And if you don't have RAID on your motherboard, you can use uh, Windows Software RAID, which again is just as good. Um, in fact, it's likely to be more reliable as we have less components involved in the system. You know, there's no hardware RAID card to fail. RAID 1, though, is limited to just two drives. Um, and that's just not enough space for me. Uh, I also want better performance. So let's look at the next setup, RAID 0, which uses striping. So we'll start again with a two disk setup. In RAID 0, the data is striped across the disks. Um, here's the first, first half of our data. The first four bits go on the first drive and the next set of four bits go on the second drive. Now, both disks are writing real actual data, not redundant data. So our OS sees the file being written at 2 times 230 megs a second, which is 460. So we're predicting a write speed of double that of a single drive. So now let's look at reads. 
When we read the data back, the OS gets given a whole stripe worth at a time. The first disk gives us the first four bits, the second disk gives us the next four bits. So two times 230 megs a second again is 460 megs a second as far as the OS is concerned. So my prediction says 460 meg read, 460 meg write. What did the benchmark return? And again, the writes are a little bit higher than our calculation due to the caching, but basically they're both in the right ballpark. Now, unlike RAID 1, the cool thing about RAID 0 is not only do we get all the disk capacity that we paid for because there's no redundant data being written, but we, we also can use more drives to go even faster and get more performance as well as capacity. If we add a third drive, we can predict that we should get three times 230, which is 690 megs uh, of read and write performance. And what do we get in reality when we benchmark it? Basically write on the money. Add a fourth drive, do some simple math, we're expecting 920 megs a second. And again, the benchmark confirms it. Now note that we don't actually get the full 230 times 4, at least not in the reads where the cache isn't involved. Nothing scales perfectly and we'll see, we'll see the gains from adding each drive fall slightly short of what our predictions are. But the important thing is you can see that adding drives to the array increases performance as well as capacity. Nothing's free though. And the downside of RAID 0 should be pretty obvious. We're getting the full capacity that we paid for because we have no redundancy. If we lose even one drive, all the data is gone. Everything, all of it. So it's very fast, but it's very risky. It's not for me, um, not on a storage server anyway. Now, if you need this kind of speed and you don't care about protecting your data because you have several backups and good on you if you do, then this might work for you. And again, there's no benefit of a hardware RAID card for this. Use the motherboard RAID if you have it or the Windows or Linux software RAID if you don't. There's no performance benefit. So now let's move on to RAID 5, which is striping, but with additional parity information. You'll need at least three disks for RAID 5, so we'll start with that. Now this configuration stripes our data over two disks, one less than what we provided it with, just like before, and then it writes parity data to the third disk. So what is parity data? It's extra data that lets us calculate the missing data if we lose a single disk. Now this requires doing a simple calculation, um, but it will bring you know, your motherboard or software RAID system to its knees. So while you can run RAID 5 uh, on your motherboard RAID, you really should buy a hardware RAID card because it'll have a chip that's fast enough basically to keep up. Now the method that we're using is called exclusive or, and it works like this. It looks at the data in our example, one bit at a time on the two disks, and it writes parity data using this simple lookup table. If there's a one on either of the disks, but not on both disks, it writes a one to the parity disk. If there's a one on both disks, it writes a zero. And if there's a zero, again, it writes a zero. So here the first digit on the first disk is a one. The first digit on the second disk is a zero. So as per the table, it writes a one to the third disk. The second digit on both drives is zero. So the second digit on the third disk is a zero and so on. Then we write our second stripe of data and we move the parity to a different disk. Um, if we had a third stripe of data, we'd move it to another disk again. Now an earlier RAID setup called RAID 4 kept parity on the same disk every time, um, but RAID 5 spreads it around. Now in terms of performance, we're writing real data to only two disks at a time. So our OS sees 460 megs a second on writes. So now what about reads? Well, we read one stripe at a time again. And again, there's only usable data on two of the disks. The parity stuff is redundant. You know, it's not telling us anything we don't already know. Um, so in this case, we're getting read speeds of 460 megs a second. And what did we actually get in our real benchmark test? Again, we're right on the money. So now let's see what happens when a drive fails. And this works for any of the drives. Um, I'll just use the first one as an example. Boom, it's gone. So we put a new disk in and the system sets about rebuilding what was on the failed drive. How does it do that? Again, it's just using our little exclusive or trick. And again, the first digit on one of the remaining drives is a one. So we write a one. We follow the same rules for all the other digits and look, everything is back the way it was. It's pretty clever, right?
While the drive is missing, the system can still serve as our data by doing this calculation on the fly. But obviously that means it'll be slower than usual when it's running in degraded mode, um, which is what we call it when we have a failed drive in our array. So what happens if we had a fourth drive? Well, we get extra capacity and speed. Again, we write parity data to one drive in the same way that we did it before using the expanded version of the table. We again lose one drive's worth of paid for capacity and our read and write performance, which has the remaining three disks to play with, um, should give us 690 megs of read and write speeds. And what did we actually get? Again, the right ballpark, just a little bit of lost efficiency that comes from scaling up. So this setup is basically as resilient as RAID 1, as in we can lose one drive and still have our data, but we can expand our capacity out, something we can't do with RAID 1. And the more drives we use, the less capacity as a percentage is lost to the protection mechanism. And it also gets faster. But I'm not going to use this configuration either, because there's actually a nasty downside. When we lose one disk, we do indeed still have our data. But if we lost a second disk, then we'd be up the creek without a paddle, um, as again, all our data would be lost. Now you might be thinking, well, what's the chance of losing a second disk? It's actually pretty low, despite what some people will tell you, but you are at the greatest risk of losing that second disc when you're doing the actual rebuilding. And why is that? Well, because all the discs in the entire array are gonna be working flat out for several hours, if not days, rebuilding the protection back for you. They're gonna get very hot, and they're gonna be at risk of an unrecoverable read error, which will stop the rebuild, and again, you'll lose all your data. So the rebuilding is what you know will lose us our data. So I'm not gonna be using RAID 5 either. Now, I'm gonna be using RAID 6, and RAID 6 basically just doubles up on the parity data. It's not the same parity data repeated. The first one is calculated the same way that RAID 5 did it using exclusive OR. But the second one requires a much more complex lookup system that I'm not going to get into here. But it does mean that we can lose up to two disks and still be okay. So this means that if we lose a disk, then during the rebuild, we lose another. We don't lose our array and all our data along with it. Um, we should be able to complete the rebuild and then replace that second failed disk, rebuild again, and hopefully be good. Now this does mean that I'm gonna lose two disks worth of capacity. As I'm only starting off with four disks, it means I'm only gonna get two disks worth of read and write performance. Um, so 460 read and 460 write. And that's what the benchmark shows. But every time I add a drive in the future, I'll be adding pure capacity and performance. Um, I don't know how it'll scale until I actually try it. That second parity calculation puts a big strain on the hardware RAID card. But optimistically, um, it might look something like this, which with eight drives in it should be able to saturate a 10 gig Ethernet link. So I hope this clears up how RAID works and why I went with the setup that I did. Note that in reality, the size of the stripe is much larger than in our example. Here we just wrote four bits to each drive. But in a typical RAID system, the stripe will be anything from four kilobytes to even one megabyte in size, depending on whether we're tuning the system for small or large file performance. If you found this review helpful, let me know by hitting the like button and dropping me a comment. And check out some of my other reviews and how-tos, and don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss any future videos.